Turning now to the defense side of the aerospace industry, uh, the most important line from a metals perspective is the line for procurement. Uh, I've also included lines here for research and development, that is the creation of new products, but not the production of new products. And then the O&M, the operations side, the, uh, the mechanics of war fighting, uh, basically spare parts, fuel, all that other stuff. Uh, but what matters from a metal perspective is procurement, that middle line, the maroon one, and it tells a very interesting story. You saw a tremendous ramp up uh, during the last decade for very obvious reasons, but with a peak around FY08 uh, because of the, the Iraqi surge, a lot of that purchased mine resistant ambush protection vehicles, things like that. That was kind of a one-off event. The real peak was in the 130s. And since then, uh, we've come down quite a bit. Now, when people talk about uncertainty moving forward, I think one thing that gets lost in the debate is that the decline is behind us. Almost every projection moving forward is basically upward, uh, perhaps a little bit of erosion in terms of actual buying power due to inflation, uh, but I'm not aware of any forecast moving forward that doesn't show an upward angle. And as a matter of fact, just a couple of days ago, the, uh, the final appropriations bill was signed, it was above this. We have $91 billion in procurement money in the request. Uh, the actual, I believe, was 93 and a half. And there might be more with uh, overseas contingency operations, OCO funding, basically supplemental spending. Um, in other words, this is probably more of an upside story than a downside story. And despite all the negative headlines about sequestration and the Budget Control Act, uh, this is actually a fairly healthy market. Now, we've got a bit of a conundrum here in the uh, fighter business, which, of course, is the key source for uh, airborne metal um, demand in the, in the military aerospace arena. Uh, as you can see, we had some really good years over the past uh, four or five years. We reached the wonderful Reagan peak. Uh, under Reagan, we purchased uh, about $11, $12 billion worth of jets, uh, and this, that's an FY14 cash. Uh, and we got about to the same level in the later years of the last decade, early years of this decade. The problem is we didn't actually purchase any aircraft because of the higher unit production costs and, of course, the higher materials value of these aircraft. We went from purchasing 387 fighters during the peak year of the Reagan buildup to about 75. Now, what are the consequences? Well, obviously, there's the negative part, which we've got this very old almost geriatric force of F-15s and F-16s and F-A-18s. Uh, the positive side is they need a lot of structural work. So demand for metals is probably going to pick up, not in the procurement budget, but in that O&M budget, because you're talking about the need for new longerons, new wing ribs, whatever else, to keep these 25-year-old jets sustainable. Uh, there's just not enough replacement aircraft. The other thing that's good is that because you've got uh, this crisis, basically, you haven't really cut force structure, you've just cut the number of new aircraft replacing old ones. Um, you've guys basically got a floor under this budget. It's not going to fall. As a matter of fact, this FY15 number was increased to the tune of about $2 billion the other day. It's not reflected in this chart, but it went straight up with the budget adjustment. They added four JSFs to the budget request, uh, bringing, I believe, to 34 planes this year and uh, 15 EA-18G variants of the Super Hornet. So another couple billion uh, added to this. That was really welcome. And it reinforces my message that there's a floor under this and we'll probably go north of it. Looking at the fighter market moving forward, obviously there's, there's a number of changes uh, coming up. <laughs> Frankly, the biggest is that most people are under risk of going out of business if they aren't the Joint Strike Fighter. You look at that gradual ramp up that we've seen in F-35 demand uh, and F-35 funding and output, it's been far lower than expected. Originally, I think we were supposed to be towards 70 planes a year at this point. Uh, but here we are, we're stuck at about 30-something. If you look at ju just above that maroon line, 
uh, you've got this checked area. That reflects international demand, which is gradually picking up. Just yesterday, uh, Norway got its first plane. Uh, you're starting to see more and more orders placed, primarily for test aircraft, but also for production aircraft. Australia, Israel, Japan, South Korea, all of them have placed orders. Uh, this is good because uh, if the U.S. budget doesn't come through, if it doesn't keep getting plus upped, then uh, we're going to be dependent upon international demand to get that ramp up going. And uh, the, new, the new theory is really quite good. These numbers are pretty conservative, but it leads me to one conclusion, which is that eventually we do get there. The peak rate should be about 160 planes per year. Uh, I don't see any major showstoppers. How do you break that down? 48 for the Air Force, another uh, 24 for the, uh, for the U.S. Marines, probably no more than about 12 or 18 for the U.S. Navy because, frankly, they have their own ideas about uh, planes and their F-35C commitment is pretty lackluster. And then another 70 or so for international cu uh, customers, and there is where you've seen the most strength in recent years. That's primarily a response to tensions in Asia with, uh, with China, but also tensions in the Middle East and certainly tensions in Europe too. As a matter of fact, Italy has its own production line, which will deliver the first plane in March. Uh, so that number is expected to ramp up nicely. Now, if you're anybody else making fighter jets, uh, the numbers aren't so good. Uh, the Joint Strike Fighter is basically squeezing everybody else out of the market. Uh, Tuesday's appropriations bill gave a lease on life for another year uh, for the Super Hornet line, another 15 planes. St. Louis badly needs that. Um, every little bit helps. That basically extends production into 2017. Beyond that, all bets are off because, frankly, that plane has not been a success on international markets. There's only one customer, which is Australia. They've, they're going to take the last of their planes also in 2017. After that, it depends on additional numbers for the Navy. There's a very good chance we'll see them, but there are no guarantees. If you look at all the other planes, F-15, F-16, Eurofighter, Rafale, they're under serious pressure. From a European production perspective, it's only Gripen that looks set to keep going. Rafale might keep going if India signs for its expected um, order for 126 planes. That order is been under negotiation for several years now. They claim this is the year coming that it will happen. We'll have to wait and see, but it would give that plane a lease on life. If you look at the undetermined slice of our forecast, that yellow blob, that shows all of the undetermined fighter contests out there. And these are people like, say, Kuwait, UAE, Malaysia, um, that have basically not made a commitment to a fighter yet. And if you make a fighter and you're not the joint strike fighter, you really badly need to win one of those competitions if you're going to stay in business beyond uh, the late years of this decade. If you look at the breakdown of this chart, you can see that the market has been pretty steady at about somewhere between 16 and 18 billion for some time now. There's absolutely no threats to this market in terms of technological substitutions. The view of unmanned aerial vehicles has changed radically in the past few years. Once they were seen as a substitute for fighter aircraft, now they're seen more as reconnaissance and, and quite frankly, targeted assassination uh, aircraft rather than fighter surrogates. In other words, the way we picture fighter usage moving forward is going to be fairly constant. Most countries are basing their force plans uh, around basically fighter acquisition, traditional, relatively traditional approaches to air power. Now, looking at this from the standpoint of U.S. manufacturing, this is a real sea change. If you take those numbers, you add on all of the other aircraft the U.S. builds uh, for transport, for training, for everything else. Um, boy, this is really a grim scenario, and it looks like it's happening. There are a lot of lines that are scheduled to close in this decade, uh, whether it's the, the T-6 trainer, the C-17 transport, which will deliver its last jet uh, in 2015, or whether it's the F-15, the F-A-18, or any of these, Basically, it's all being replaced by the F-35 if it's combat and the continued C-130. It's an interesting story. The C-130 is the world's longest-lived aircraft program. It first flew 60 years ago 
uh, a remarkable achievement. It's been rejuvenated. It's another interesting story about the, uh, the durability of older aircraft design. It's been rejuvenated with new avionics, new engines, new mission systems, but it's basically the same tube and the same wing and the same materials metal used on it. In, uh, in other words, it's effectively a new aircraft, but it, from a metal standpoint, it's really exactly the same. The joke is that 23rd century archaeologists will probably find the production line still active somewhere. Uh, it's just remarkable how enduring uh, the appeal of this plane has been, both for the U.S. customers and for international ones as well. Now, in terms of new starts, there are a couple of new ones. The Air Force has its TX program, which is designed to replace the T-38. You can see a little thin slice at the very top begin to emerge in 2022. More likely, that's a 2023 story. The other program to keep your eye on is the BX, the new generation bomber, which is coming down the pike also in the mid-years of the next um, decade. These are just going to be prototypes at first, but of course it should lead to a full production program. Funding for this is starting to look pretty strong. Um, what will it be made out of, no one can say. Probably it'll have a higher percentage of composites as the B-2, the most recent bomber, uh, did. It's only in the military field where composites are less a story about economics and more of a story about performance. That's where you really see the battleground between metals and composites these days, but composites seem to have won in many cases when it comes to uh, new aircraft. It's the, the durable appeal of planes like the C-130 that keep metal usage strong. Now, Boeing faces a particularly acute crisis because if you look at the breakdown of its combat aircraft, its military aircraft, it's heavily dependent upon three platforms. The C-17, which they have announced is a line that will be shutting in 2015. The F-A-18, which is, I mentioned is, is living kind of hand to mouth. It's now into 2017, but beyond that, all bets are off. And then the F-15, which is scheduled to shut in 2019 after the last Saudi Arabian aircraft is delivered. Beyond that, what you're going to see is the company turn towards military derivatives of its uh, commercial jets. KC-46 tanker, which is a variant of the 767, all metal. Um, and of course, the P-8, which is the maritime patrol version of the 737, again, all metal. Uh, so if there's one positive news here on the military side, it's the arrival of military derivatives of metal commercial aircraft uh, propping things up. Beyond this, it's essential for Boeing to win the next generation bomber program. Uh, they're uh, competing in conjunction with Lockheed Martin and against the Together, the, uh, together uh, against Northrop Grumman. And uh, that will probably be decided in the next few years. But from the company's standpoint, uh, from the standpoint of watching military aircraft change at Boeing, uh, it's, they're going from a company of dedicated combat aircraft and dedicated military aircraft to a company of uh, military derivatives of commercial jets. In Europe, it's a different story. Um, there are more programs that are probably going to be more durable. One likely death, unfortunately, in the next few years will be Eurofighter. Uh, there have been major issues with the home markets there, uh, Britain, Italy, Spain, and Germany, uh, in terms of their defense spending. There have also been problems securing uh, more than a handful of export orders, mostly from Saudi Arabia. So that line will probably shut down uh, towards the end of this decade. The Rafael will keep going, particularly if India signs. The A400M is, is a, a bit of a shocking story. Uh, it, 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 looked like it would be underfunded. It looked like there'd be major development uh, problems. It looked like there was almost no way it could survive. Everyone kept cutting cash for it. And there were major issues with the contract vehicle itself because it was a fixed price contract that didn't cover any cost overruns. But miraculously, it survived. And it's uh, going to basically be the lion's uh, share in terms of uh, European military aircraft output moving forward. An almost all metal plane um, with some composite usage. Uh, you look at it right now, they're starting to deliver aircraft. It's, it's, it's a bit of a shocking success <laughs> considering where it came from. Turning now to rotorcraft, uh, there was a remarkable run up in US military aircraft, uh, rotorcraft demand, particularly due to the surge in Iraq and Afghanistan. 
Uh, an awful lot of the aging fleet needed to be replaced because of the stress of usage under hot and high and desert environments. Uh, but now, of course, demand is coming down. Uh, that's inevitable given the tremendous growth we experienced during the last decade. Hopefully it won't come down too far, but on the other hand, uh, this is the softest part of the market. In terms of international military, it's a bit stronger. The civil market is showing signs of life. That's good after a cyclical downturn during the Great Recession. Uh, but basically, rotorcraft, that's more of, a, uh, more of a flat story in aggregate. Turning now to UAVs, people talk about UAVs. And certainly from the standpoint of warfighting, they're hugely important in terms of reconnaissance, in terms of uh, uh, pinpoint strikes against high-value targets. Absolutely essential. But if you look at it from the standpoint of mass production, hasn't happened, doesn't look set to happen. What you've seen instead is a couple of large production programs, uh, but <clears throat> basically most of it is just almost boutique uh, and, and prototyping efforts. You look at it from the standpoint of manufacturing, you're only looking right now at about two billion a year. Compare that to the 20 billion or so in fighters, it's just an afterthought. Even with a significant ramp up with more capable UAVs in the next decade, you're only going to get to about four, four and a half billion. The way to look at it, frankly, is if uh, aircraft were cars, like the automotive industry, these are the bicycles. They're just not that important from the standpoint of manufacturing, certainly not from the standpoint of metals either. When you look at the aircraft business, the most important thing to remember is that it's truly a global enterprise. Uh, Vertical integration went away in this business decades ago and shows no signs of coming back. You outsource as a jet prime for a number of reasons, but mostly it's to access risk-sharing capital from foreign or even domestic partners. That means getting them to chip in to the cost of building a new jet and, of course, giving you greater leverage and the ability to create more new products when you want to. Uh, when you look at the patterns of aircraft imports, this is primarily for uh, Boeing and U.S. manufacturers, Gulfstream, for example, or Cessna or whoever, but you see some really interesting patterns emerge. One is that the market for outsourcing internationally is probably outperforming the aggregate market. Uh, the other is that this is a game of high-skill, high-wage manufacturers. This is not the kind of race to the bottom in terms of lower-cost manufacturers that you've seen in so many other industries like consumer electronics or, or automotive. Instead, you've got high-skill, high-wage countries. Look at the top three, Japan, Canada, Italy, very high-cost, high-skill, high-wage, basically contributing their ability to raise cash and their expertise in, say, specific types of structures or landing gear or anything like that to the business of building aircraft. Now, if you're selling metal out there, I, I think it's important to bear this in mind, to remember that this is a global business. These people do indeed take large quantities of metal. And also that because of these high barriers to entry, the people who buy from you today are probably going to be buying from you in 10 years. This is a business with very few breakthrough countries. In many markets, in many industries, you uh, note the rise of China. China really hasn't budged much in this game. It's still well under half a billion in terms of imports. And you see similar numbers out of Europe. They're just not that big a player. The one country that has made it into the top, uh, the top five or six in recent years is Mexico. And uh, that's really not about cost, that's about proximity to market, that's about the development of skills in certain areas like Querétaro. Um, that's more of an effort to create something that's really high skill, high wage, rather than simply relying on very low costs. Now, as it turns out, there is some degree of disaggregation of low cost assemblies, for example, wiring harnesses and bundles, and some of that does go to lower cost countries. But as I mentioned, the overwhelming majority, certainly the top five, are high skill, high wage nations. Let's summarize the aggregate market for aircraft moving forward. I'd like you to walk you through uh, what we're expecting in terms of uh, output for the next decade. First of all, if you look at the breakdown of anticipated deliveries in our forecast by civil and military, it's roughly 74, 25%. Um, 
that doesn't mean profits will follow that. That doesn't mean development money will follow that. It certainly doesn't mean metals demand will follow that. As a matter of fact, I would argue that given current trends, civil markets are probably closer to maybe 80, 82 percent if you had to break this down from a metals demand standpoint. But still, this gives you an idea of the relative importance of the markets. The other pie chart speaks to an issue that I'm always keen to stress when looking at the aerospace business. It's a very top-heavy business. Uh, you look at the top five programs, they're 44 percent of output. How many programs are there? Well, of course, there are hundreds. Uh, but if you look at the next 15, you add them together, you're up to 72 percent of output just from those top 20 programs. You'll see those top 20 programs in just a moment. But, but the remaining programs, the other, well, 100 or so, are only 28 percent of aggregate output in our forecast. So a very top-heavy uh, sort of forecast. This next chart illustrates that. As you saw in the previous pie chart, 72 percent of output in our forecast is for 20 top programs in this business. And you can really see just the importance of these programs and, and of course, which exact ones they are uh, in this chart here. The blue bars corresponding to the, uh, the, the lower axis basically show uh, total deliveries in the next 10 years. The red bars are deliveries over the past 10 years. So you can show uh, whether these are growing or shrinking programs. Um, the other thing that hits you is that the two commercial jets for the, the narrow body market segment, the two big single aisles, the A320neo and the 737 MAX, these have been in production for decades. They're all metal. It's not going to change, not for another couple of decades, probably. The 320neo just arriving in 2016, the 737 MAX arriving a year or maybe two years later. Um, these are really the big drivers behind commercial jetliner uh, demand, basically about 50 percent, as I mentioned before. And from after that, uh, it begins to trickle down a bit to the 787 and A350, which are the two big new generation composite jetliners, the F-35, the 777. If you were to combine the 777 and the 777X, a couple lines below, you'd get further out. You'd see some really big numbers. But you can see all the others and how they line up. Uh, the point is it begins to really trail off once you get below the top five and then top, top 20. Beyond this, you know, you really get into very small production numbers. So when you focus your marketing and sales efforts, it's important to keep this in mind because, quite frankly, this is where the cash is at the very top programs in terms of overall volume, overall output. I'd like to talk for a moment about composites versus metals. And obviously, this has been a key issue of debate in the aircraft business for several decades now. There are a number of factors that influence things. One, of course, is producibility costs. There's been some progress in getting down the cost of composite structures, but still, uh, that's a big missing, uh, we don't know the answer at the end of the day. We don't know what it really looks like to produce large composite structures, and we don't know how the technology there will change. And of course, metals aren't standing still either. New alloys have different producibility costs. Um, you also have an issue with minimal thickness that's really raised its head. Uh, back a few years ago when everyone was quite exuberant about the 787 and its use of carbon uh, structures, uh, the feeling was this technology could migrate downward. Uh, but minimal thickness requirements have really changed that. The best example I can think of is the Mitsubishi Regional Jet, which was originally going to leverage Mitsubishi's role on the 787 and take that carbon tube technology and migrate it down to a 70-seat regional jet. Uh, that went very badly wrong because it turned out uh, the minimal thickness required for composites in a fuselage of that class pretty much obviated any weight advantage. So they turned to metal. It's now a 75% uh, metal jet. Another, of course, is risk. When you add new materials, you're inherently adding risk. Then you've got structural weight versus total weight. This is an issue that's emerged over the past few years. When you build a bigger jet, like for example an A350, structures are a very large part of the aggregate weight of that aircraft, but you migrate downward, say, to an A320 or a 737, and the non-structure weight of the aircraft is so much greater as a percent. The interiors, the batteries, the, uh, the, the cockpit, anything that uh, basically is, is, is not a structure is a much greater part. And so therefore, if you swap out uh, the 
metal structures for composite structures, in aggregate weight of the aircraft, you might not be saving all that much. And that's, that's what's kept Airbus and Boeing from switching over to uh, composite designs with their narrow body programs. Another issue, of course, is maintainability. Boeing made great strides to uh, show that field repair was relatively simple with the CFRP, but for some people it remains a concern. One reason that Bombardier uh, stuck with, uh, with metals for its fuselage on its C-series was a fear of, well, frankly, the repairability of ramp rash, uh, the tendency for aircraft to get dinged by luggage carts and whatever else, refueling carts, out there on the airport tarmac. There are still some concerns about that. It's also important to look at the experience of composites versus metals in the business aircraft industry. You look at the aircraft that were developed with composites, the, the legendary Beach Starship of the 1980s, followed by um, the, uh, the, the Hawker 4000 and the Hawker Premier 1, uh, which became the Hawker 200. All of these were miserable failures, uh, whether from a maintenance or for, rather from a technology development standpoint or from a producibility standpoint. All of them were major disappointments and all of them are out of production. They were all complete fiascos. Right now, there is only one new business aircraft with a composite tube that's in development. It's Lear's 85. It's, un, it's run into some serious problems, both from a company funding standpoint and from a technology maturation standpoint. Everybody else in the business aircraft industry that is introducing new models, like Gulfstream's recently announced G500, 600, before that their G650, um, certainly the new Dassault series, the Falcon 5X, the Falcon uh, 9, 8, 8X rather, uh, all of these programs have one thing in common, which is that they use metal aircraft. Business jets clearly aren't uh, a way for composites to break into this business. It's also kind of interesting, from a U.S. military procurement standpoint, there was going to be sort of a, a destroyer analog to the Dreamliner program, the destroyer 1000, DDG-1002 series. Uh, about a year and a half ago, the Navy just suddenly said, you know what, we're going back to metal. It just isn't worth, worth it. And I think that was an interesting comment that even though composites certainly do play a significant role in aerospace and defense, they may have been a bit oversold and that it's very clear that metals are still going to hold the lion's share of aerospace materials and defense materials output for quite some time. I'd like to sum up uh, the market now as we see it. This takes all of our existing forecasts that you've seen before for the various segments of the industry, gives you 10 years of history, 10 years moving forward. As I mentioned, people movers, the commercial aviation side of the house, more than half of the industry by volume. You've seen ups and downs in many of these segments, but you add it all together, and despite the program risks, despite the changes, this is a remarkable market. We outperformed pretty much anybody else in the manufacturing world during the greatest economic slowdown since World War II. We came through it just fine. And there we are, as I mentioned at the very start of this presentation, at about 170 billion in deliveries this year. We're gonna to get towards 200 billion in today's money by the end. We could even be higher. As I mentioned, there's a lot of conservatism baked into our forecast. A little concerned, perhaps, about irrational exuberance on the jetliner side. But if you accept that moderation carries the day, this is just a fantastic market in aggregate. And just a summary from the standpoint of December 2014, great market. Most segments look strong. Remember back in black for the first time in 2013 with no red ink to speak of. A little bit of risk in going too far on jetliners, especially with cheaper fuel playing a role. That's something you really have to watch moving forward. And more importantly, it's something that people who do rate output announcements that Airbus and Boeing need to watch before they get too aggressive. North America is the real success story here. It's kind of remarkable. Um, not just for commercial jetliners where airlines are suddenly in good health back in North America, but also from a defense standpoint, North America is really the key driver, the U.S. of course. But it's true for business aviation, North America is now the big driver of the recovery. Again, very high entry barriers in this business. If you look at it from the standpoint of a metals producer. You look at the evolution of technology and the jetliner business and all the other aerospace businesses too. Your best friend is the turbine engine. You look at the remarkable success that turbines have enjoyed in terms of product improvements and uh, evolution uh, over the de past decades and the decades to come. 
Turbines are getting better and better to the tune of about 1% every year. And that means the incentive is to keep with existing platforms and rejuvenate them with new turbines. So again, the best friend of metals is the jet engine. Richard, uh, great information. Thank you for taking the time to share all that with us today. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thanks for bringing me here and thanks so much for listening to me. Again, my guest has been Richard Abalafia. He's Vice President of Analysis for Teal Group. I'm Scott Drake. This is the Aluminum Channel.